So in today's lecture, we are going to discuss the conjugate gradient methods. This method was first proposed by Fletcher and Reeves in 1964. And essentially this method seeks to be better than the steepest descent method. Now we have seen in a prior lecture that one of the problem with the steepest descent method is that the consecutive search directions that is dk, dk plus one and so on are normal. That is the dot products are zero. And this leads to the zigzag behavior of the search direction, which is especially problematic as you get closer to the actual optimal point. So this zigzag behavior tends to slow down the steepest descent method. Now the conjugate gradient method does a slight deflection of the search direction of the steepest descent method. And this small deflection results in a considerable improvement in the convergence properties of the steepest descent methods. Now, before we go on and describe the conjugate gradient method, I will spend some time discussing what exactly is meant by this word conjugate. And it actually comes out from the concept of conjugate directions. So we are going to define conjugate directions. And in a later lecture, we will see why this conjugate direction property is very important for the conjugate gradient method. So to look at this concept of conjugate direction, consider a quadratic function. So here f of x is a generalized quadratic function written in a matrix form. And A is a symmetric positive definite matrix of size n by n, implying that there are n design variables. So again, recall that being a quadratic form, we can write this as x t a x, where A is a symmetric positive definite matrix. And then there may be some linear terms here. Now, we say that the directions d1 and d2 are A conjugate if d1 transpose a d2 is equal to 0. So here d1 and d2 are two vector search directions. And a conjugate refers to the fact that this a matrix is coming in here. So it is not like d1 t d2 equal to 0, but there is a a between these two. And therefore, the conjugacy is with respect to a here. Now, generalizing this concept, we can say that if we have search directions d0, d1, d2, all the way to dn minus 1, these are a conjugate if di transpose a dj equal to 0 for i not equal to j. So again, you are seeing here that 1 and 2 are different. So i not equal to j, this is 0. Now, the conjugate gradient method which was proposed by Fletcher and Reeves, the conjugate directions were defined in this form. So if you look at this definition very carefully, the first term here is dk is minus ck. And this is nothing but the steepest descent method. Now what Fletcher and Reeves do is they add this extra term here, which is this scalar beta k into dk minus 1. Now dk minus 1 is the search direction at k minus 1 point. So again, you have this from your previous run of your code. And therefore, there is no problem calculating this dk plus 1. You simply have to store it. The second fact is that beta k is defined like this. So it is the ratio of the norms of ck and ck minus 1, the whole thing squared. So again, you can see that since at each point you are calculating the gradient vector, you have ck at the current point and you have ck minus 1 from the previous point. So if you have calculated the norm of these vectors, which you should because you need to check the convergence of the method at each point, then you can very easily calculate this beta k and insert it here. So this particular component here, beta k dk minus 1, is a small deflection on the negative gradient. And therefore, it actually turns out to be better in terms of convergence of this particular method. Now, we will show later in this chapter and further lectures that these directions are conjugate for quadratic functions with positive definite and symmetric matrices. Now, before we get to that, we are going to check the first step, 
which is that anytime a search direction is proposed, we must check whether it satisfies the descent condition. So now you recall the descent condition is CK dot DK is less than zero. So we will insert DK here and see if that satisfies the descent condition. So if we take CK dot DK, we put the Fletcher Reef search direction here and we expand it out, we get this term here. Now, of course, this term is not a problem because you can clearly see it is less than zero because it's the dot product of two gradient vectors and there's a negative sign here. Now, if you look at this sign, what you can start realizing is that this is the line search criteria. So if you recall the line search criteria, we wrote it as CK plus one dot DK equal to zero. And so if I change K to K minus one, I get CK dot DK minus one equal to zero. So if I impose the line search criteria here, then my search direction is a descent direction because then I get this value here and this becomes less than zero. So again, this is an important fact to remember is that I am assuming here that the line search termination criteria is completely valid and therefore I am assuming that an exact line search is used because in that case this particular condition will hold. So now that we have shown that the conjugate gradient proposed by Fletcher and Reeves is a descent direction, we can write down the method about how to implement this in a computer code. So again, you start with the starting design x0. This is a fact for all the gradient based methods. You set k equal to zero, select epsilon is some small number which you will use throughout the algorithm, maybe 10 to the power minus eight. The first step is that you need to calculate the search direction and at this point you don't have the search direction which has gone before. So the way to start the conjugate gradient method is to use the steepest descent direction. So you use D0 is minus C0. Now you check at this point if the norm of C0 is less than this small number you have selected. Now if this is true, which is very fortunate, then the starting point is a stationary point and you can immediately stop your process. Else you perform one round with the steepest descent method and then set k equal one and then go to step two. Now again you calculate ck and check if the norm of ck is less than your small number stop else continue. Now you calculate the new conjugate direction which is dk is equal to minus ck plus beta k into dk minus one where beta k is defined as this ratio of the gradient vectors at the kth and k minus one -th point the norms squared. So again, here one good point about the Fletcher is method is this is always positive because you are squaring this particular value and anyway, the norms are also positive numbers. Now, at this point, you have the DK minus one because you have done your first iteration in the steepest descent method and you also have your CK minus one from your first round calculation. So once you have got this search direction, you calculate the alpha value to minimize this function and here you can use a good one dimensional search as a golden section or quadratic search or cubic search because you want to get a good estimate of alpha here because these methods are dependent on the line search. Now you update your design. So xk plus one is xk plus step size into dk and you get your next point. You set k to k plus one and go back to step two. So again, you keep this. So this could be in a while statement or a do statement. And then you keep doing this until this particular condition is satisfied. And if you want, you can impose some more conditions based on the value of K. So you can put a K max here or something like that to make sure that you have an, a strategy for leaving this particular do loop in case you get stuck at a certain problem. So there are situations where your algorithm can get stuck and you can escape that by providing a k-max value. So now let us give some comments on this conjugate gradient method. We see that the first step of the conjugate gradient method is the same as for steepest descent and further steps are modified by using a scaled or a deflected search direction. So essentially we can think about this conjugate method in a more general sense. 
that this is a basic deviation from the steepest descent method where we change dk is minus ck to dk is minus ck plus some vector g which is an appropriate vector which prevents the zigzag behavior of the steepest descent method and in fact we can think of many methods in this form as they tend to take the gradient vector and then to modify the gradient vector slightly so though theoretically speaking the steepest descent direction should yield the best result but that only happens in situations of certain peculiar condition numbers in most real functions you need to deflect this method by using some kind of vector g here now we also notice that since ck and ck minus 1 as well as dk minus 1 are there from the previous time you ran your code you can calculate the conjugate gradient in a single step so essentially you use vector math here and you simply add the gradient to this term and you can very easily calculate this term on the go so conjugate gradient method involves a very simple extra step on the steepest descent method and if you have written a computer program to write the steepest descent method the conjugate gradient method just involves you to add this beta k dk minus 1 where beta k is this all the information is there with you from the matrices so just you have to ensure the fact that at the k minus 1th point you save this dk minus 1 and save the ck minus 1. Now you don't want to carry all these numbers in of course in case you are doing research you may want to um, for some situations carry them and plot them and so on but in general you do not want to carry all the k minus 1 you just want to retain the last value to calculate this particular thing now there are certain facts which we are going to prove later but i'm going to state them now the first is that the conjugate gradient method finds the minimum for positive definite quadratic forms with n design variable in exactly n iterations and this is a fact which we will prove in the next lecture now the conjugate gradient method becomes ideally suited for quadratic forms but if you put it on general functions in general it is best to restart the iteration process after k is n has been completed and this is a good thing for computational stability in actual coding conjugate gradient method is often used for problems with very large number of design variables such as 10,000 100,000 million and so on and in such cases the conjugate property of the direction can degrade before you have even reached this k is equal to n value because of round off now these round offs can cause the algorithm to degrade from its theoretical predictions and also the less similar the function is to a quadratic function the more rapidly the conjugate gradients will cease to be conjugate so this is an unfortunate fact that the round off which is involved in most computers may lead to conjugacy loss now also if you have a very large size problem such as even take n is uh, uh, thousand or something like that you don't want to wait for k is equal to thousand for a reasonable solution so some of these problems in the conjugate gradient method can be mitigated by scaling the problem such that any ill conditioning of the matrix a of the quadratic form is reduced and there is a process called preconditioning which is very often used in these conjugate gradient methods now beside the fletcher reeves method there are some more methods which are variations of the conjugate gradient method which use different formulas for this scalar number beta k for example two popular situations are there they are called the polak rebier method and the heston stifel method now recall the fletcher's reeves method is given here where we saw dk is minus ck plus beta k d dk minus 1 and beta k is defined like this now polak rebier defined beta k like this and heston stifel defined beta k like this now in both these cases you are only using the gradient values at k k minus 1 and in this case you also need the search direction value at k minus 1 but all these values are also required in the fletcher reeves method so actually if you are writing a computer program uh, 
you can put in DK for the Fletcher Reeves. You can also put in the values for Polar, Trebier, and Heston Stifel, and you can have different beta K values for these three methods and calculate the slightly different search directions and use that problem. But one advantage of the Fletcher Reeves is that the beta K positivity is guaranteed because you are using norms and you are squaring this year. But in these cases, it may be more complicated to ensure something like that. So we'll see that case later. Now, there are certain cases where this polar Krebier method may continue going on indefinitely without converging. But according to literature, for many general problems, this polar Krebier method converges more rapidly than the Fletcher Reeves method. And the convergence of this polar Krebier method can be guaranteed by starting the method if beta k is less than zero. So like I mentioned that unlike for the Fletcher Reeves method in the polar Krebier method, beta k may become less than zero. And so you simply restart the method at that point. Now, in general, any conjugate gradient method can be restarted when beta k is less than zero by simply using this formula that beta k is max of zero and beta k. So essentially, if beta k is negative, you use beta k zero, which is essentially the steepest descent method, which restarts this particular process. So again, very easy to code this inside your computer program to safeguard your method from a crash. So some final comments on the conjugate gradient method. In general, we see that the line search in conjugate gradient is more important than for many different methods, because we also saw that the proof that the conjugate gradient is a search direction or a descent direction uses the line search termination criteria. So there may be certain peculiar situations where if that is not satisfied, you may not get a descent direction. However, an important advantage of the conjugate gradient method is low storage requirement. So we see that no matrices are being used here, only vectors are being used here. And then people who are clever in terms of programming may actually be able to program this method with very minimum storage space requirement. So we will see later that the quasi-Newton and Newton methods where uh, matrices are used, uh, the H matrix or approximations to the H matrix, those would require you to always carry these matrices with you and to do multiplication of matrices with vectors and so on. So all that work is saved in the conjugate gradient method. So again, the Newton quasi-Newton methods we will study in chapter four in the book, which will come in later chapters. Right now we are in chapter three, which is the conjugate gradient method. So again, very interesting development, a slight deflection of the search direction of the steepest descent method leads to much more improved capabilities and conjugate gradient methods remain a very popular method as far as unconstrained optimization problems are concerned. So in the next few lectures, we are going to look at how these formulas came up. So in this lecture and in many books, they have introduced the conjugate gradient methods out of the blue and show you the different formulas as if they are coming from some magic. But in reality, there is a derivation behind this and this derivation is based on quadratic functions. So the way these methods are developed is that you develop a method for quadratic functions and then you set these methods onto general nonlinear functions with the hope that any nonlinear function essentially behaves like a quadratic in a small region close to the point you are at. So that is something very important to consider. Also consider that all these methods do require a starting point. So again, the value of x0 needs to be known. And this becomes important, especially for many engineering design problems in that you may not have a good starting point. And again, that is something you can mitigate by starting from a large number of starting points. So that's something which is the philosophy behind so-called multi-start methods. But uh, that is certainly possible. If you have coded up any of these methods, you can use random number generators to start from a plethora of different starting points. And then you can converge to different points from here. And if you have a global minima, your chance of getting a global minima can increase even if you are using gradient based methods because one of the issues in gradient based methods is people say they can get stuck in a local minimum point, but there are ways to get around this problem also. So again, I hope you enjoyed listening to this video and stay tuned to my channel for further videos on such topics. Thank you very much.